Let's take another look at what a patient is. A patient is not just that person sitting in the office trying to get a workup or going through treatment in the hospital. A patient actually is the unfolding of an entire life from a zygote through maturation and reproduction all the way to death. A patient is on a trajectory and you see them as a point on that trajectory. The important uh, consideration here is that the different parts of the life history are connected and we can learn a lot about a patient from understanding what happened to them before they came into the office. That's why it is so important that taking a medical history become detailed enough to pick up effects that happen very early in life. Patients have life histories that evolved and now the intervention of modern medicine and public health has actually caused selection that is driving the evolution of further changes in patient life histories. Patients are phenotypes and they consist of traits, not of genes. Life history evolution is the part of evolutionary biology that is analyzed, uh, that analyzes trait evolution. Life history evolution uh, explains why organisms are small or large, why they mature early or late, why they have few or many offspring, and why they have a short or a long life. So these are answers to big questions, including one that's quite important now is degenerative disease mounts around the globe. That is, life history evolution explains why organisms must grow old and die. So, what causes life histories to evolve? Life histories result from the interaction of extrinsic and intrinsic factors. The extrinsic factors basically are things in the environment. They influence age or stage-specific rates of mortality and reproduction. That is where nutrition, disease, violence, medicine, and public health all enter the picture as selective agents. The intrinsic factors, the things inside the organism that are involved in life history evolution include trade-offs among traits. Trade, I've highlighted trade-offs here in red because they are such a central insight and such an important element of explanation. Here, all sorts of things are involved. Phylogenetic history, genetics, development, and physiology. The method of analysis is basically a cost-benefit analysis. For example, what are the costs and benefits of maturing earlier and later? What are the costs and benefits of investing more in each of a few children or less in each of more children? What would the ideal balance be? The method that has been developed for analyzing trait evolution in life histories can suggest how all phenotypic traits have been designed by natural selection. So let's take one example age and size at maturity. This is a pivotal event in the life of any organism. Up until then, uh, natural selection has kept them in great shape and designed them for reproductive performance. Once they start to mature, they also start to age. Natural selection will shape the evolution of age and size at maturity so that it maximizes the benefit minus cost relationship, the difference between benefits and costs. In looking at that, we make a few assumptions. We assume that delaying maturity improves offspring survival. We assume that delaying maturity improves offspring number. In other words, the older you are when you start having children, the more of them you can have and the better shape they'll be in. We assume that if you were to mature earlier, you'd get a shorter generation time. That will get you more grandchildren faster. And we also assume that if you mature earlier, that shortens the period that you're at risk before you have children. So you'd be less likely to die before you had your first child. So those are some very general and, and probably very important factors that are shaping the evolution of the maturation event. This is one way of implementing the assumption about offspring quality. This line here showing an exponential decline is relating the age at maturation to the instantaneous mortality rate. 
And what we have here is the instantaneous mortality of a, an organism that's maturing early. So that would be the mortality of its offspring would be higher if it matured earlier. And if it waited and it matured at this age, it would have lower instantaneous mortality. What is meant by instantaneous mortality? Well, the survival to age x, which we denote L sub x, can be modeled as e to the minus dx. And in this equation, d is the instantaneous mortality rate. So it is this d which is being plotted on this y-axis here. Now, what about the uh, assumption about how many offspring an organism will have? Well, basically, if there's a linear relationship between the size of the organism and the number of offspring it can have, its weight and its number of offspring, and it can grow longer by delaying maturity, then it can have more offspring. Or putting it another way, if you start having children earlier, you'll have fewer later on because you'll be smaller. You will have diverted some of your allocation from growth into reproduction, and you won't have that increment in size later in life. Now, life history evolution all got started with this equation, the Euler-Lotke equation. And it has the essential attribute that it takes a bunch of life history traits and it relates them to fitness. Here are the elements of that equation. Age is denoted as x, fecundity as m of x, so it's a function of age, survival as l of x, it's a function of age. Fitness is denoted as r, that is the rate at the exponential growth rate of a population that would have particular life history characteristics. The Euler-Lotke equation says essentially that when a population is at equilibrium, the integral over reproduction time survival discounted by e to the minus rx added up between age at first birth, which is alpha, and age at last birth, which is omega, will add up to one. That's kind of an opaque relationship, and I'm not going to derive it here, but basically it says that a stable population will grow smoothly and exponentially with all of its parts connected in this relationship. Now, to bring back those prior two slides, if we take the juvenile mortality assumption, we can build it into this survival term here. And if we take the fecundity assumption, we can build it into this m of x here, this term here. And we then have an equation where we can look at the relationship between fitness and changes in age of maturity. So we let juvenile mortality change as a function of age of maturity, and we let fecundity change as a function of age of maturity, and this is what we get. Here's an example for the western fence lizard. This would be optimizing age of maturity in a single environment. If we just make the juvenile mortality assumption, we get this relationship between fitness and age of maturity. And if we just make the fecundity assumption, we get this other relationship. In fact, both things are probably going on. And the actual age of maturity is indicated by this arrow. So in fact, the linear fecundity model comes really quite close to predicting the observed age of maturity. We would predict maturity would be right here at peak fitness. Now, what would happen if the organisms that were encountering these uh, situations actually experienced a range of environments? Well, that would generate some problems for them. For example, if they were growing rapidly uh, and they matured at this point, that might be great in that environment, but if they were growing slow, slowly and they always matured at the same weight, they would have to delay their maturation from there to there, and there, there the problem would be that they might get killed. They might get eaten, they might succumb to disease, all sorts of things could happen. If they had another simple rule of thumb, which would be perhaps always mature at the same age, when they're growing slower, they're much smaller, and they can have fewer children. So there they suffer a fecundity loss. Well, these are the two major components of fitness, mortality and fecundity. And so just on that qualitative sketch, one would expect that they'd make a compromise, which has been indicated here in red, that they'd make some flexible compromise that was better than a fixed rule. If 
you actually go through the calculations. This is the optimal situation predicted by a theoretical model for the maturation event when you have variation in growth. So these dotted lines are four different growth curves. This is the top one is fast growth, the bottom one is slow growth. This thick line here is the predicted reaction norm. It's relating age on the x-axis to size on the y-axis. And basically what it's saying is that the optimal thing to do is to mature young and large when growing fast and to mature old and small when growing slow. That all sounds very fine, but does it have anything to do with real organisms? Well, let's take a look at human females. Here are Rose Frisch's classic data that compare women in England and Scotland during the 19th century Industrial Revolution, who are this inner curve here, with women in Iowa, in a Hutterite community, uh, mostly in Iowa farm country, uh, in the uh, middle of the 20th century. The important point is that they both have pretty similar Northwest European genetic backgrounds, but the 19th century women are being stressed, they're not eating well, they're working hard in steel mills and things like that, and the 20th century women are eating much better, their health is better, they're living on farms, they're adequately nourished. What you can see is that women in the 20th century were growing faster and they were maturing either by age at menarche or by peak fitness for procreation or when they first become fit to procreate, or by their best fitness for procreation, that would be the age at which their infants would have very good survival. That difference is about four to six years, and that's a plastic difference. If you look at that in a model for optimal reaction norms, what you can see here basically is, are two growth curves. The dotted lines are growth curves for women in different environments. These are growing slowly, these are growing rapidly. If we put in the data for the 19th and the 20th century, we predict that women in the 20th century will simply slide up this reaction norm. They'll mature earlier at a larger size and they will do so about five years earlier. That is the response to nurture. However, the same conditions that improved their diet also changed the selection on their life histories. There was a drop in infant mortality rates. The drop in infant mortality rates meant that it was less costly to mature earlier. So if this population here in the 19th century was at an evolutionary equilibrium and the costs in that equilibrium equation were lowered, you would expect them to take advantage and to shift their maturation down, down and to the left. In other words, there is both a developmental response and a genetic response. The developmental response is the response of nurture and the genetic response is the response of nature. In a study of maturation in the women of Framingham, Massachusetts, there was a surprising confirmation of this. The selection operating on height and age at first birth was measured and the change over the next 10 generations was projected. Women in Framingham who were uh, born and reproducing in about the first half of the 20th century were predicted to evolve to be a little bit smaller at maturation and to do so about six months earlier. And if you go back and you look at this response here, that's precisely what's going on in the model. So what's going on in Framingham? Well, these women have, are in a generation which has just moved through the demographic transition. They are experiencing better health care. There is better hygiene, lower infant mortality rates, and it pays to mature earlier because you don't pay the cost of higher infant mortality if you mature earlier. The rate at which they are predicted to evolve is actually right in the middle of all of the rates of evolution that have been measured in natural populations. All of these dots here are uh, rates of evolution on the y-axis measured against the period of observation in log years on the x-axis. Most of these are for mosquito fish, guppies, Galapagos finches, and things like that. 
look at where the humans sit. They're right in the middle of that cluster. In other words, humans are projected to evolve at the same rate in Framingham as natural populations. So why earlier and smaller at maturation? Well, age and size at maturation are determined by trade-offs between infant mortality and age of mother. In all populations, offspring of really young first-time mothers suffer higher mortality rate. Okay? Here is the relationship for all of the infant deaths in the population of the United States in 1960 and 61. There were 107,000 of them. What we have here is infant mortality on the y-axis and the age of the mother at birth, at her first, when she first gives birth, not her birth, but at the birth of that infant. Okay? You can see that the best age to give birth at is about between 18 and 30. Very young mothers run very high risks in giving birth. Their children are much, much more likely to die. There are actually data here for mothers that are as young as eight years old. They're usually victims of family rape. Over here, where the curve bends up, that's the famous biological clock that so many professional women worry about if they haven't had a child before they're 35, because it gets more and more difficult and complicated to have children as you approach 40. So this is the relationship. And what's happened, essentially, is that modern medicine and uh, hygiene and vaccines and things like that has shifted the whole curve down and to the left, so it's shifted this point over to the left here. That's what's driving this change. It was done by reducing the evolutionary costs of earlier maturation, where the benefits are actually remaining the same. So that will shift the equilibrium point earlier in life. The entire reaction norm then moves down and to the left. And similar effects, this is not just Framingham, similar effects have been found in Finland and Australia, two other populations of humans that have moved through the demographic transition and now enjoy modern medicine. So the important points here are these. What evolves in life history evolution isn't a fixed value of age at maturity or number of offspring or mortality rate at age 40 or something like that, but the entire plastic response, which is the reaction norm. Reaction norms depict the interaction of nature and nurture, that is, of genes with environment, in a way that makes it clear that it's not one or the other, but both. Public health measures and good medical care have population level consequences. They change selection pressures. They alter the course of evolution. And the Framingham study describes what's going on with the biology. Cultural evolution is also going on. Women are encountering both their biology and their culture, and the culture is pushing them in the other direction to have their first child later. The result is increased conflict between biology and culture. So to summarize, selection shapes life histories from birth to death. Changes in life history events have costs and benefits, and selection acts to maximize the cost-benefit relationship. That process is constrained by trade-offs. Trade-offs connect traits genetically, developmentally, and physiologically. When traits are so connected by trade-offs, then if you try to change one to improve fitness, you'll cause a change in another one that decreases fitness. And what evolves is often not a fixed trait, but its plastic response or its norm of reaction. That is, how it is expressed as a function of the environment encountered.